Chapter 4 The next morning Sterling woke early to the sounds of birds singing outside. Yawning, she debated snuggling back in for the warmth, or answering the call of nature. The fact that the stove had gone out, and she was hopeful of a jar of instant coffee Jake had unearthed, made her crawl out from under the covers. First, she hobbled over to the stove and got it started. Her knee had swollen further during the night, probably from all the walking they had done yesterday. It ached horribly, but she would just have to put up with it. Next, Sterling made her way outside. It was a beautiful sunrise. It would be even more beautiful if she had appropriate clothes, a coffee in hand, and indoor plumbing. Shrugging, she looked around for an appropriate spot when she saw the outhouse. Outdoor plumbing. Maybe with toilet paper? Sterling stumbled through the snow, using nearby trees to help her make her way to the tiny structure with a traditional moon cut out into the door. Wait. She hauled out her phone, taking a picture of the outhouse, the shack, and the sunrise through the trees. Perfect, Sterling thought. All good fodder for an article of making their way down the mountainside to rescue. She hoped things were not evolving too rapidly elsewhere in the Ramsley family drama. Sterling had been out of touch and desperately needed to engage with her contacts for information so that she could get her articles written and submitted to Grange. The last thing she needed was Grange to declare her MIA and decide to put some other climbing tabloid writer in her place to cover the Ramsleys. That could be the death of her career. As much as she would rather not work at the tabloid, Sterling was not ready for that, which meant she had to submit today if she could just find a signal right at the outhouse. Even better, as it was private, and Jake would have zero chance to interrupt to find her email in Grange. Sterling stepped inside, happily typing on her phone as she enjoyed the necessity. Email and photos sent, Sterling leaned back with a smile. She checked her other emails and texts. Ted S. No known allergies. Was in good health. Autopsy results support anaphylaxis shock diagnosis. Sterling quickly texted a contact she had at the Ramsley Pharmaceutical Company. This contact was fairly new, and Sterling was not sure she would be able to get the information that Sterling wanted. However, she knew of no one else except the Ramsleys themselves who might have access to this information. Mindy Need info if Ramsey Pharma ever aborted research on a drug due to allergic reactions. Thanks, Sterling. Thank goodness her email was stuck on autocorrect. Maybe they could manage to email someone since Sterling was getting a good enough signal to send out the emails. A text popped up. Who is this? You do realize it's not funny to send texts like that. Max Ramsley. Possibly their ticket out of this mess. Sterling was about to ask him for his email address when she realized that without an A, it came out more like email dress. She didn't think that he would get the point. Sterling looked at the phone. Three signal bars and low on battery. Pressing the call button, Sterling decided to grab Jake to convince Max of who they were. Max Ramsley, blow it up demolition services, came a deep voice over the phone. There was some static on the line, but otherwise the signal was surprisingly good. Max, this is Sarah Hawkins. I was traveling on the plane with Jake Ramsley, your cousin. The plane crashed. Sterling took a step. There was a cracking noise as a rotted board gave way under her foot. With a shriek, she fell forward, wedging her knee between the floorboards. A piercing pain traveled from her already swollen and hurt knee up her leg. Sterling grabbed at her knee, which was stuck between the boards, gasping in pain. Hello? Hello? Max's voice came from far away. Sterling looked around frantically. I have dropped the phone. Look, we're stranded in the mountains after the plane crashed. You need to get someone to trace this phone call, then search and rescue can find us. Hello? I can barely hear you, Max yelled from the phone. Who did you say you were? Stay on the line, Sterling called out. Jake, Jake, I need your help. My name is not Jake, replied Max. You're breaking up. 
Don't you dare hang up on me. Sterling could not find the phone. She tried to move her leg, but it would not budge. Jake! The door of the outhouse opened, and Jake frowned. What is going on? Down here, Sterling sagged in relief. My leg is stuck, and I'm not sure where the phone went. Going down on one knee, Jake looked at the area by Sterling's knee. Looks like the wood has rotted out. Can you get me out? she asked, blinking back tears. Her knee was throbbing. Just a moment. Jake ran back to the shack. Hey, was that Jake? Max asked excitedly. I am so glad you are okay, man. When your flight did not come in, Dylan was having all sorts of worries. We are not okay, shouted Sterling. We are stranded on a mountaintop and need you to get emergency services to look for us. Did you say the plane crashed? questioned Max. Yes, Sterling said in relief. Finally, he was starting to get their predicament. Listen, we're on a logging road in a shack of some sort. We do not know where we are. You need to phone police to tell them what I've told you. Here, Jake puffed as he carefully went down on his knees in front of Sterling. He had a block of wood in his hands. We're going to use this like a hammer to get rid of some of more of the wood that does not look too good. Once I make a big enough hole, you should be able to pull your leg out. As long as I don't fall through. Sterling could not feel any bottom beneath her trapped foot. Grab hold of the doorway. Jake began pounding the wood around Sterling's leg. What is that noise? Max's voice was faint. Was that a phone? Jake stopped in surprise. Yes, there was a signal and I thought I would try to see if I could call out. Sterling tried to budge her leg, but it remained firmly entrenched. Unfortunately, it called Max. Where is the phone? Jake looked around. It fell through the floor when I dropped it, she explained. They're stuck on a mountain, Max explained to someone on his end of the call. Do you know where you are? No. Sterling wanted to scream and pull her hair out. She's pretty sure she had already said that bit of information. Max, it's Jake, he called out as he leaned a little further into the outhouse, conscious of the rotting floor. We need you to find out who is in charge of our rescue, and let them know we're on a mountain with a logging road and a small shack. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll ask, Max said impatiently to someone. Do you know what direction the face of the mountain is? What? Sterling looked at Jake in confusion. Are you on the south side, east side, north, or west? It might help with the search part, reasoned Max. We don't have a compass, Jake sighed in frustration. We don't even know what state we are in. How can you not know? Max's voice cut in and out with static. Check the sun. We are going to lose him, whispered Sterling. The battery of the phone is low. Max, just tell us that you're going to talk to whoever is in charge of rescuing us and let them know that we are stranded. Jake listened for Max's faint reply. They heard nothing. Max? Sterling called out, but there was no answer. I guess your phone is dead, Jake stated the obvious. She swallowed hard and tried not to cry. They won't be able to find us. What do you mean? He frowned. If the battery is dead, it's not sending any signals to the cell phone towers. They can't trace us if we leave here, so they won't be able to know our location. She gave an involuntary sniffle. Sterling did not want to cry. It was useless to tear up at this sort of situation, no matter how frustrated she was. And we stay where we are, Jake said reasonably. They'll find us from the last call. Plus, your knee is not going to be in good shape after we get it out of the floor. What if they don't find us before the food or the wood is used? We'll have to move and they won't find us. Sterling wiped a tear away. She was going to lose her job over this. Without her cell phone, she could not take pictures, write any articles, or email them to her boss. Unless they got rescued by the end of the day, Grange was going to give her spot reporting on the Ramsleys to someone else. Hey, Jake took her cold hand in his. We can ration out the food. As long as we're warm and okay, we can stay here. Maybe someone will come by for ice fishing and be surprised that he has guests in his shack. Sterling nodded in misery. 
Even if Max managed to get the authorities to trace the call, it could be weeks for them to cover all the area. The logging road was a good clue, but how many logging roads were in the area? Were they possible for vehicles in the winter? Was this particular logging road even on the map? I'm going to try and get you free. Jake let go of her hand, and Sterling immediately missed the contact. She berated herself for feeling of loss. Jake was just a source for her articles. She could not grow dependent on him. He picked up the piece of wood and began hammering beside her knee. Moments later, Sterling could feel the wood near her leg shift, and she was able to pull up her leg a little. Can you help me up? she asked. Jake carefully helped her stand. Sterling took one step and gasped, sinking down as the pain from her knee protested at any weight being put on it. Here, use me as a crutch. They each wrapped their arms around the other for support to make it back to the shack, Sterling hopping on one leg through the snow. As Jake helped her to sit on the cot, Sterling groaned as a thought crossed her mind. A pin! What? Jake frowned as he carefully tore open Sterling's pants at the knee to have a look at the grotesquely swollen and bruised joint. I should have gone to Google Maps and dropped a pin on our area, Sterling lamented. I could have read the coordinates to Max, and they would have found us. Your phone may not have been able to open Google Maps, Jake reasoned. It was broken. Plus, it might not have worked anyways. The app takes data, and who knows how good of a signal was available. Three bars, she moaned. I had three bars on the phone. Jake looked at her, not sure what to say. He did not like the thought of her blaming herself. It still might not have opened the app. We'll never know now, she rubbed a hand over her eyes. I am so sorry, Jake. I should have thought before trying to phone Max and using up all the battery. It's okay. Jake sat beside her on the cot and put an arm around her shoulders, drawing her close to him. You were just working on our previous plan. We gave Max all the information that we knew. We will get rescued, Sarah. I feel so stupid, Sterling said quietly. You did okay. He rubbed her back as he tried to reassure her. Next time you find yourself in this situation, you'll know exactly what to do. There will be no next time. Sterling gave an unamused huff of laughter. Quitting your job as a flight attendant? he asked. She gave him a small smile. I just don't think it was for me. If you ever need a job in the insurance industry, let me know, he offered. Thank you, but I think I'll try writing, Sterling grimaced. If she had a job when she returned to the city, she would be grateful. Some people say I have a talent for it. I promise to buy your books, Jake gave her a smile. Really? she asked in surprise. Sure. Any time someone comes in my office, I'll point to them and get to tell a great story about how we were stranded on a mountain and this impressive flight attendant saved us by calling my cousin, Jake grinned. Now you are patronizing me, she rolled her eyes. No, I'm not because it's going to be true. Jake got up from the cot. Now, I think you should lay down and elevate that knee. See if I can find something to put some snow in so you can hold it against the knee and get the swelling down. Sterling leaned back on the bed, putting the lumpy pillow below her knee. She kicked off her two tight shoes and pulled the blanket up over them for added warmth. Jake was right. She had no way of knowing if her phone would have been able to pick up their location. It was unfortunate that they would never know. If there was a way to charge the phone battery, then they might get somewhere. However, the shack had no hydro. It did not help that her phone was somewhere in the outhouse, probably underneath it. She was never getting that phone back, Sterling moaned. It had all her contact numbers. She was going to have to take a lot of time to rebuild that list. Fortunately, her emails were backed up, so she still had all that information saved. Jake returned with a bag filled with snow, laying it on her knee. I'll get breakfast started. Can we have coffee? she asked. How she longed for a cup. Coming right up. Jake looked through the cans on the shelf to see what was available. Hey, there's oatmeal. Sterling made a face. Not her favorite, but beggars could not afford to be picky. What do you think, peach flavored or raisin oatmeal? Jake held up packets of instant. Oh, Sterling perked up. It had to be better than the plain oatmeal. Peach, please. Jake happily melted snow and put it around the stove. What 
was your childhood like? Sterling wanted to know. What do you mean? He frowned as he mixed the oatmeal with hot water. It was a typical childhood. We went to school, had friends, played sports, all the normal stuff. She rolled her eyes, even though he could not see it since his back was turned to her. How can it be typical when you were raised in one of the richest families in the country? My mom made sure it was typical. She felt it was important for us to grow up without any sense of entitlement. So we did pretty much everything normal middle-class families did, hence the camping. Jake shrugged. I never really thought about it. I grew up with two younger brothers, and mostly we had a lot of fun. Define fun, prompted Sterling. Just fun kid stuff, shrugged Jake. We visited our cousins a lot, went to the beach, skied during the winter seasons, played golf, built a treehouse, typical stuff. Sterling had her doubts on that. Even with Beverly Ramsley's influence, some of the wealth attitude must have kicked in, because Jake sure did not do things middle class now. He had a driver, played golf on the best courses, ate at the best restaurants, flew in a private plane. What are your brothers like? Everett is out in Europe on a fool's mission trying to expand our business interests in Europe. I think it's just a waste of money. With the regulations and traditional ways of doing business over there, it's a real uphill road to try to break into the European market. I think Dad was wrong to try and expand in today's market. Jake pulled breakfast off the stove, waiting for it to cool a little before helping Sterling to sit up so that she could eat. And Dylan just got remarried, so he's probably pretty happy when he's not worried over the current mess. Thank you. Sterling sipped the coffee. It was a little strong without any sugar or cream, but she desperately needed the caffeine. Jake's revelations about the European market was not news, unfortunately. None of this was useful for her articles. Billionaire thinks he had normal childhood. Yeah, that was not going to sell papers. What was your childhood like? Jake turned the chair at the desk so that they would be facing each other. Any brothers or sisters? One brother who's older than me. Sterling smiled. I grew up in a tiny farming community. My parents own a farm and a business that employs most of the town's population. There are only about 700 people or so in Pendle since the economic turndown. I had my own horse. I was on the girls' field hockey team. Had a lot of friends. I was even a cheerleader for basketball since we did not have enough people to play football. Sterling shrugged. It was a pretty good childhood. Why did you leave? wondered Jake. Small community, everyone knows everyone, and there just wasn't much for job opportunities, sighed Sterling. I could work in my parents' business or leave to pursue my dreams. I left. I know a few people in the press, offered Jake. I could give them your number. Maybe you could get an interview. Or, if you're interested, we have a marketing press position with the company. I think there is a spot open. Thanks. That's really nice of you. She was not about to take him up on the offer. As soon as he saw the pictures in the tabloid and realized she had taken them, he would come to the conclusion that she was Sterling Denver. Then all the little moments of camaraderie, like this one, would be suspect in his mind. Jake would probably hate Sterling more than he did already. Sterling felt a pain at the thought. The truth was, she kind of liked Jake Ramsley. He might be autocratic and sometimes a little annoying, but he had shown a lot of resilience during the hiking they had to do. He'd also been nice to her, making her silly pants to keep her warm, giving her the foot massage, cooking for them. He even saved her from a bat, which was way out of his comfort zone. Normally, Sterling did not have the opportunity to get to know the people she was writing about. She knew things about them, for sure, but to actually take the time to get to know them and talk to them? That did not happen. People generally did not want to talk to the tabloid reporter who was going to portray them in a light that probably was not too positive. If they did want to talk, it was through lawyers or to sue, or just to fling insults her way. Usually, Sterling did not give a second thought to the feelings her writing might give to any people that she wrote about. In her opinion, they were pampered, rich, and famous. A tabloid article was a minor inconvenience for them. Usually, she did not care what they thought about her. Having a negative reputation was part of the job. She cared what Jake would think about her. 
That was a revelation, Sterling thought in surprise. She was very much afraid that she was going to disappoint him, and the thought did not sit well with her. Jake, I'd like you to know that I've really enjoyed getting to know you, Sterling began haltingly. I should probably tell you something. Wait. Jake froze, setting down his coffee slowly. Did you hear that? What? She frowned as he went to the door and opened it, leaning out. Part of her was relieved that he had interrupted her. What had she been thinking? Confessing her pen name and having him hate her for the rest of the limited amount of time that they had together? Foolish. What if he asked her to stop writing articles about the Ramsleys? She could not afford to give up her income. It not only had to carry her own limited expenses, but she had other responsibilities that her income provided for. I hear a snowmobile, Jake listened intently. The sound of a motor was faint. Sterling heaved herself off the cot and hopped to the doorway. It's coming closer. We are getting rescued today. He grinned as he leaned down and gave her an impromptu kiss thankful that they were finally going to be safe and on their way back to civilization. It was just a light brush of his lips against hers in a friendly way. What Jake had not expected was the physical reaction. Kissing her was like nothing he had ever experienced before, and he wanted to do it again. She blinked up at him like she could not quite believe it herself. The motor of the snowmobile was getting louder. "'I'm going to use the silver blanket to try to flag them down,' Jake tore his gaze away from Sterling grabbing the survival blanket. Okay, Sterling said a little breathlessly. Good idea. Sterling watched as he made his way out into the snow, following the noise of the machine. Once he was out of sight, she closed the door, stoked the fire, and sat down on the cot again, putting the homemade ice pack back on her knee. It had barely been a kiss. She smiled at the memory of it. He had just been happy to think about getting out of here and back to the normal world, she told herself. It did not mean anything, even if it had made her toes curl. So quick and fleeting, yet wow, she thought. Who knew that Jake Ramsley would be a good kisser? It could just be a form of Stockholm Syndrome. Not that either of them had been kidnapped, but they were spending a lot of time together. Surely, once Sterling had seen other people, she would not find Jake quite so attractive any more. She might even wonder what she had seen in him in the first place. That is what she told herself, as all sorts of irrational worries crossed her mind as time passed. Thoughts of Jake falling down an abandoned mine or well, or some of the snowmobilers deciding to capture Jake for a ransom after they recognized him, or of him getting lost in the wilderness. He had admitted that he was poor at camping. It only followed reason that he would not be good with a sense of direction. Sterling calmed herself with the thought that they had both shown streaks of practical behavior during this ordeal. Jake would be okay, and he would find the snowmobiler. Hopefully, they would be on their way out of the forest and mountains at any moment. She added wood to the fire and put on a little more water for coffee. Sitting at the desk, Sterling shifted through the papers that had been left out. Mostly, she wanted to combat boredom yet there might be a clue as to where they were just in case Jake did not manage to snag the snowmobiler's attention. There might even be a map. Excited at the thought, Sterling shuffled through the paperwork. There were old bills, some awful poetry about the landscape, a list of things to do which ironically included replacing the rotting boards in the outhouse floor, and plans for a chicken coop. Frowning, Sterling wondered why the person who owned the shack had abandoned it, or if they were coming back. Maybe they chose to winter elsewhere, or perhaps they were visiting someone. Pondering at what their mysteriously absent host might be doing, Sterling looked at the dusty wallpaper until she noticed it was a series of lines and written words. Grabbing a dirty towel, she dusted off the old and yellowed paper to find a map held onto the wall by four thumbtacks. Eureka! Sterling carefully removed the aged map from the wall and looked it over. If she could figure it out where they were in relation to this map, they might be able to walk out of here to the town that was listed on the corner of the map. Let's see, Sterling muttered as she read. Mountaintop, 
Cove's fishing pond, old Bernie's place called Side Road. I don't think I would want to go to Den's misery. Jerry's logging road. They could possibly be on Jerry's logging road. Sterling studied the map. Prime hunting here, Buckshot Caves, Terry Whittle Homestead, and the little town is called Yurt's Siding. She hoped they were at old Bernie's place. If that were true, then they could walk to the homestead, then onward to the town, taking called Side Road. If this was a map of the area that they were currently in. Sterling turned the creased paper over to see if anything was on the back. Notes. Lots of handwritten notes. Big Buck found two miles west due to Old B's place. Jerry's men over the boundary again, August 2nd, 1988. Crossed half a mile onto Bernie's land, documented. Chickmunk invaded cabin today. Three hours to evict the creature. Found Old Wellhead, covered with boards for safety. Six ounce dust from the week of panning, mountaintop. Chipmunk returned, put crumb trail out of door, eventually left. Found bear trap, one mile northeast of Ollie Oak Tree, disabled. Chipmunk again, left door open so could leave, not feeding it this time. Documented another incident of Jerry's logging over boundary line August 26, 1988. Named Chipmunk Larry. Sterling giggled as she read through the rest of the notes, noting that Larry the Chipmunk had turned into quite a pet. The worst part was now knowing that the map was probably irrelevant due to its age. Turning back to the map, she saw a tiny little sticker. I don't know, Waldo, Sterling remarked dryly. Where am I? The little sticker silently stared back at her through his thick glasses. Not that she expected an answer. The door opened, startling Sterling. She turned in her chair to find Jake gratefully warming himself by the stove. How did it go? Did you talk to the snowmobiler? Never talked to him, admitted Jake, frowning. I managed to spot him and wave the blanket, but I don't think he saw it. If he did, he's a real jerk because he never came to investigate. Sterling slumped in disappointment. Not that the little shack was not a lifesaver and cozy but they had to get back to their lives. I found a map. Really? Jake brightened. Let's have a look. It's thirty years out of date. Sterling handed it over. It could still be relevant. Jake's brows furrowed as he looked at all the different landmarks. You grew up in the city, right? Do you know how many streets and places get built or torn down in thirty years? Sterling asked reasonably. This is not the city. It's the countryside. It's logical to assume that land is developed more slowly here. There should be fewer changes. He turned the map, looking out the window, trying to place where they might be in contrast to the logging road. She smiled ruefully. I suppose you've never heard of the direction story, then. What direction story? he asked absently. Well, if you want to reach the Davis farm, you need to take second line out past the milliners, turn right before the bridge... Take the left fork in the road at Ma Benson's old place, which is now the Talbots, since it brought it three years ago. Then, past the church that burnt down last spring, take a left again. It's on the right side, past the good peach orchard, not to be confused with the bad peach orchard. If you see the old country schoolhouse, you've gone too far, finished Sterling. People do not give directions like that. Jake gave her a look of disbelief. People do where I'm from, she shrugged. Country life is a little different. How would anyone know where they're going if they had never seen the landmarks? He questioned. Usually someone will get in the car with them to direct the stranger. They'll also question the person about why they're in town. Sterling smiled at the memory. Once it was an insurance guy who was overcharging Ma Benson on her life insurance policy. The boys had him turning in circles until he ran out of gas. He had to walk back to town in his fancy loafers and suit to purchase a jerry can for the jaguar he was driving. Ma Benson is a real person? Jake was entertained and surprised. Yes, this was a real-life example I just gave you. Sterling had a smile at his expression. For a moment, she thought it would be fun to take him back to her rural roots to see how he would cope with all the people she had grown up with. That was a dangerous thought. She sternly admonished herself, tantamount to wishing to introduce him to her parents.
something that was never going to happen. Sterling needed to stop seeing Jake as a friend. He was just someone to write about. If you enjoyed this chapter, look for the next chapter of Stranded with the Billionaire, book six of the Ramsley Brothers series. Please also consider subscribing to this channel. This is free for you to do, and it helps you to find further videos of the Ramsley Brothers series. Have a great day and happy listening!